Hey everyone, Nick Russo here. Today I'm going to talk about automation for bureaucracies. Specifically, this is about network automation and how we can do just basic uh, device setup and teardown, maybe provisioning a new site and things like that in a very bureaucratic organization. I'm going to describe what I mean by that a little bit later, but I wanted to kind of set the stage. This is me recording, kind of doing a fresh recording of a talk I gave at Interop about a month ago, and I'm doing this so that everyone else on the internet can get the benefit of uh, hearing the tools and techniques I used to overcome some of these challenges. So here's the agenda for the discussion. First, we need to do a situation appraisal. Basically, step back, look at our current situation, identify the current flow of work, and look for points of improvement along the way. Then I'll propose a couple different technical solutions, some of which are going to be suitable, some of which are not. And we'll kind of, I'll give you kind of a play-by-play -play of what happened in real life as we were looking at solutions to our problems. Then we'll do a quick live demonstration. This will be not a terribly technical one. I just want to show how the solution works at a general level. I think you can all appreciate that. And then last but not least, I'll talk about the outcomes, both in terms of time, money, quality, all those important things, as well as some real quotations from uh, the customers I was working with on the solution. So again, first, we need to sort out what's really going on here. So I'm going to describe the current process for doing the work inside this organization. The first thing that happens is some administrator, like a knock person, will open up a Microsoft Word document. Inside that document is going to be like a, a router config that has IP addresses that are highlighted in yellow with a little parenthesis comment that says change here, and then the person needs to manually type in some other address. Naturally, we used Excel for this, so there'd be a giant IP spreadsheet and someone would manually type in IPs from the spreadsheet into the Word document, and that's how we would build our configurations. Uh, no automation at all, completely manual process. So once the configs were done, we needed to add some diagrams to give our operators some context around what they were going to be configuring. Because a lot of times you can't just give someone configs and say, hey, just apply this, don't ask questions. So we would handcraft a custom diagram every time, put that into a PowerPoint, and also put the configs in the PowerPoint as well. So you'd end up with this 30 or 40 slide PowerPoint that had a whole bunch of router config snippets and custom handmade diagrams. And naturally, the diagrams would all have to have their IPs hand typed, and there was a lot of room for error as well. Then we would export the PowerPoint to a Adobe PDF so that it wouldn't be writable and that it would be easy to distribute and anyone could open it or print it or whatever else. I don't know how many of you have ever tried to copy and paste from an Adobe document, but sometimes that can be challenging with the way the text is formatted and it doesn't always come out correctly. So just putting the text into Adobe and not making it easy to copy paste was a nuisance by itself. And then, of course, to, to round out the entire Microsoft Office suite, we would email that PDF to other people. So we didn't really have a, a professional distribution system either. The recipient of that email would be another person, not the original person who made the configurations, but typically someone else uh, could be in a different site. It could be uh, just about anywhere. So the person who received this email, uh, wasn't, it was almost never the same person. It was had to be someone else who applied the configurations. And then finally, this person would individually log in manually to the routers, the switches, the firewalls, and whatever else was in the network to apply the configurations and manually perform the verification. Note that the PowerPoint we shipped out didn't actually provide details on what to do. All it said was, here are the configs, here's the diagram didn't tell people what show commands to run or how to troubleshoot or any of that. So just kind of appreciate the old current operations. It's basically do everything manually using Microsoft Office and then email it to people. This is how the organization has operated for about 10 years. So what's wrong with this picture? Well, here are my observations after about 10 minutes of looking at it. I'm not going to read this whole slide to you. I didn't read it in real life either, but I just want you to appreciate all the problems here. And just to identify a few, this is obviously very error prone. So for example, hand typing IPs between different documents, the process is very disconnected. There's no change history. 
um, talking with engineers who had to work this process, they were generally very stressed out and dissatisfied with the way it worked. There were a lot of dependencies. It was just a bad approach overall. Let me talk about what I think a pretty good solution could have been. So at the time, I was still pretty new to network automation, but I had heard of a tool called Ansible, which to this day I think is a pretty great tool. So I suggested, let's see if we can use this tool to help do some of this basic automation. At a minimum, we can at least push the configurations that we generate using Ansible. That might save us some time as a good first step. I said, we really need some change history as well. So maybe we can just you know, templatize our configurations, do some variables, you know, to do the uh, substitution of IP addresses and VLANs and whatever else. And we can use the Git version control system to help us with that. That seems pretty innocuous enough. Then I said, another cool idea would be to add some kind of continuous integration here. Like for example, when I push my code into a remote Git repository like GitLab or GitHub or whatever, maybe I want to do some regression testing on my code, make sure that the code is properly linted, make sure that uh, my, my playbooks are working correctly, whatever. But basically I need some way to know that my code is of the right quality. Another problem we had is that this Microsoft Word document has no inherent error checking so you could have a typo in the config and no one would know. There's no way to check. Then we would have Ansible, you know, from the control machine, which I'm showing in orange here just to demonstrate. The control machine would be the device that logs in to all of our network uh, resources like routers, firewalls, etc., and perform the appropriate configurations. Basically, what I envisioned here was a very basic, simple infrastructure as code deployment. How do you think the customer reacted to this solution? Yeah, I got laughed at. They thought this was absolutely insane. The whole concept of infrastructure as code was completely foreign to them. Uh, any automation tools that this customer had used in the past were of the point click GUI variety, a very imperative model, click a button, do an action. The idea of uh, an item potent infrastructure as code solution was just completely over their heads. The concept of version control was, was really lost on a lot of them. And overall, this was not well received and it went absolutely nowhere. At this point, I became thoughtful and I, I really took a big step back and I said, I can't square peg round hole this problem. I need to really think about why infrastructure as code is becoming popular in the business world and why it's really not taking off in government and other huge bureaucracies like hospitals. I decided to do this by trying to compare the business drivers, or I'll call them success drivers, between businesses and bureaucracies. The first thing I noticed is that businesses typically have one of two goals, depending on where they are in their business cycle. They're either trying to grow rapidly, so grow their top line, grow their sales, or they're trying to improve profitability, maybe through a combination of growing sales and reducing expenses. In general, these are important to any business that isn't a nonprofit. Bureaucracies, on the other hand, tend to have very different goals. Especially in government, the number one most important thing is protecting people's jobs. Without getting political here, the American political system, regardless of your affiliation, is always focused on creating and retaining jobs for people. This is a hot issue for regardless of what point in time you're in. So bureaucracies are trying to protect these things. Even in enterprises that are very bureaucratic, a large organization is a respected organization and department heads or division presidents are going to want to keep their organizations large to improve their influence, even if it hurts the overall company's profitability in some cases. It really depends, but I needed to keep this in mind because you may have noticed my solution would have eliminated some people's jobs by not needing a dedicated snippet pusher guy when in reality that guy's job needs to be protected. So I needed to consider that. Businesses are often focused on gaining and maintaining a competitive edge. They want to win in the marketplace. That's pretty straightforward. The idea of a bureaucracy is very different, though. They're trying to survive forever. I read it in a book once, I can't remember which, is that if you remove half the bureaucrats from any process, the organization will still live on and it will operate exactly as it always has. This is true for probably any congressional or parliamentary organization in the world. The idea is survival. Businesses also adjust to market changes. This kind of goes hand in hand with the competitive edge thing. If the market is changing, then you generally need to adapt or you go out of business. 
Naturally, bureaucracies are focused on protecting the status quo. Change is generally seen as a bad thing, especially if the organization is still surviving. Again, if your goal is survival and not uh, being an excellent performer, then the phrase, if it ain't broke, then don't fix it, that tends to be a very common phrase in government. And I've heard that many times. In business, at least in the movies, sometimes we see you know decisive executive action. Some person at the top is being very assertive and determining how the business is going to run, and that's generally how it needs to be. In bureaucracies, we have committees, endless meetings to talk endlessly about everything. Trust me, I've seen it for years, for as long as I've been working in this environment. Committees rule everything. Businesses are largely driven by results, whether it's a public company reacting to the whims of Wall Street or whether it is a private business trying to grow its market share. Results matter. In a bureaucracy, the perception is a lot more important. And what I mean by that is you can go online and you can search around government organizations or hospitals or anything else, and they'll always claim that they're trying to do things different, that they're trying to be innovative, that they're trying to partner with industry, that they're trying to solve complex problems a new way. I won't say that they're lying, but the real thing is that they want to appear that they are trying, even though the effort is simply not there. So given these new success drivers, my Outlook on the solution completely changed. Let me talk a little about the solution that I actually proposed, which I think improves quite a bit with the existing process, though it's not quite as great as a true infrastructure as code solution. I'm still going to be using Ansible, so we're going to have someone doing some Ansible playbooks to generate configurations and all that other kind of stuff. There's no reason we shouldn't have something like that. Uh, Likewise, I'm still going to use Git for version control. Why not? There's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do version control on the code that we write. Whether it has to do with network automation or not, I still think that's a good idea. Continuous integration. Likewise, there's no reason why we can't at least do some basic testing of our code to make sure that it at least generates configurations and, and does the basic tasks that we expect from it. Now here's where things get bureaucratic. Rather than Ansible eliminating jobs and going out and touching network devices, instead, we will take all the configurations and whatever else and have Ansible export a Windows zip bundle. So basically a compressed file, something that we can transport. You might be thinking, why not just use a PowerPoint? Well, the reason is if I give you a zip file with a bunch of text files, those are easy to copy paste. They're a little more portable and they're also smaller. They're easier to deal with. So I saw this as a minor improvement. Now we're still going to use email because we don't have a good distribution system and people are generally afraid of having machines logging into equipment to make changes. So we're still going to use email. And of course, the person on the other end of the email is going to have to apply all those configurations to the devices. You might be looking at this and saying, this is hardly an improvement over the old system. And I would probably disagree with that. And I'm going to give a more detailed uh, drill down into the solution shortly. But you need to understand that building all the configurations by hand was a very time consuming process. And also we were building diagrams and the entire uh, technical procedure by hand as well. And a lot of that managed to be kind of done better through automation. So let's explore that next. So here's a little more detail on the solution that was actually built. Now again, I'm, I'm going to change the way the diagram is laid out just to make it fit on the page, but we've got our programmer type guy like me who is doing work with Ansible. So here are the different source code files that uh, I was that I included in the solution. So YAML files, uh, for those not familiar, this is generally what people write their Ansible playbooks and variables in. It's a pretty easy uh, thing to learn. There were some custom Python extensions to the project, mostly through filters for some of my other playbooks that we're not going to talk about today, but they were generally part of the solution overall. Then we had Jinja 2. This is a text templating language that integrates really nicely with Python, so that's baked into Ansible pretty well, so that was part of it. LaTeX. This is probably the most interesting one. So this is like a 40-year-old typesetting language, almost like a precursor to Microsoft Word, and I managed to programmatically tie this in with Jinja 2 and Ansible so that we could automatically generate PDFs to obviate the need to build all those custom Visio diagrams and PowerPoints that we used to do. And then last, Markdown. This was used just for our documentation and our readmes and some of the other um, to-dos that came as part of the project. 
Now the output from Ansible, the way I arranged it is that for every node, you would end up with a folder and then inside of that folder, you'd have all your configurations plus a PDF. Imagine that you work in an organization that has remote sites and you want to stand up three new sites. Well, you'd want to have a different folder for each individual site. And in each folder, you'd have the router config, the switch config, the firewall config for that site with the proper IPs and host names and all that specific to the site as well as a document that gives clear and specific information about how to stand up the site, uh, what the diagram is, what the IPs are, and have all that laid out visually. And you want this on a per site basis. So we don't want to have just one massive document that describes the whole operation. We want to do this in a kind of smaller steps. So for example, if I want to do 10, 10 sites this week and 20 next week, I don't have to make two different custom packets. I can just run my tool with a different length of nodes to be provisioned. Of course, Git is still part of the solution. Now is also a good time to mention that I used GitLab specifically for my remote Git repository. I like it because this was a private deployment not connected to the internet. So a lot of the SaaS solutions like GitHub simply were not options here. And to use CI, I rather than building like a Jenkins server or something, I just use the built-in GitLab CI using the runner concept. So we set up a few runners, registered those to GitLab, and then we had a pipeline that would run on those runners every time code was committed. First, I would do a linter. This include all of our Python and YAML code. I also kind of handmade a little Python script that would load in all my Jinja 2 templates and just quickly make sure that they were valid. So nothing too crazy there. Then I would have unit tests. So some of my custom Python code had functions and classes, so I would individually test those components. Again, this is just kind of best software practices testing that I would run behind the scenes to help ensure the overall quality of the solution. And because no one else was doing this, I didn't really eliminate any jobs. Nobody had this job in the first place. Then for those familiar with Ansible, we have this concept called roles. And a role is a way of encapsulating uh, logic for portability. So for example, um, I like to think of it almost like a class in an object oriented programming language where you have variables, you have functions, you have methods, you have things like that. In Ansible, you can group together tasks and handlers and variables and uh, custom filters and modules and all kinds of things like that. So we had a few of those in our network. Um, the actual solution that I built is very heavily based on a role and there were a lot of role tests associated with that. And then playbook tests. So this is kind of the most integrated form of testing where we would just run our playbooks and ensure that we got the proper output or ensure that we got the proper result. Now we would want some way to actually see the outcome of this testing and the GitLab install that we used came with a Mattermost server. Basically it's like a, a chat, like a Slack type thing. And we tied in some webhooks to make it work like chat ops. So our users who were in the chat could see when issues were created in GitLab, when the CI test started, when it failed, what the issues were. So it was a very good way to provide event-based monitoring to tell our operators when things were going on in the development area. So now after all this, after I haven't eliminated jobs, I haven't taken the power away from the committees, I haven't really changed much with the status quo, I've only added new capability and everyone can still go about their jobs. How do you think the customer reacted to this? Basically the same reaction. At this point, I said, you know, I've done all my due diligence, I've thought about the success drivers, I've built the solution, I've tested it, I've proven it. At this point, I took a gamble. I told them, wait. I need to show you the solution. We need to try it in real life. Let's do a pilot and let's see how well it works. I had been talking about it for several months, but nobody had really bit into it yet. So we decided to take a chance and try it out. And this was a little over a year ago. Now, at this point, I will show you a quick demo of how the tool works, just so you get an idea of how powerful it can be. Just to give you some context, I'm logged into a Linux box I've got running in AWS. And I basically just pulled down my MKFD, that's Make Files and Documentation. That's the name of the Ansible role that I wrote. Basically just pulled that down from GitHub and made a few small modifications uh, just for this demo. So for anyone who's ever worked with Ansible, this is a, just a role. So I've got a defaults, handlers, tasks, tests, vars, those kinds of things. Those are all components of the role. 
And I'm not going to be digging into those today. You can check the source code on GitHub if you find it interesting. Instead, I want to go into this samples directory because that's where I've basically implemented the role in a sample playbook that helps tie all this together in a meaningful way. So here's an example of what a playbook would look like that implements the role, or that uses it, I should say. Now this isn't a technical training video, so I'm not going to deep dive every component and explain it, but the general idea here is that we want to run the playbook called Sample Playbook, and it's going to give us a few basic outputs. So first, let's talk about how the configurations get made. The role will look for any Jinja2 templates in the directory named config templates, and for every one of these templates, this is assuming that every site that you want to build or every uh, circuit you want to set up or whatever is going to have one router and one switch. So if I wanted to add a firewall to every site, then I would just add a firewall template in here. You know, just looking at the file quickly, it's a basic Jinja template. We don't have to get too detailed with it. Just jumping around in the file, you can see I've just got some basic variable substitution, nothing crazy. Behind the scenes, I do some kind of IP address math to come up with these simple variable names, but it doesn't really matter how you do it. You can build the template however you want. Even those not familiar with Jinja2 or Ansible can probably understand what's generally going on here. I also want to show a different kind of template, which is what we use combining Jinja2 and LaTeX. So this is how we build the documentation package. It's basically a Jinja2 template, but it's LaTeX as well. Let me show you a little about what that looks like. So for those not familiar with LaTeX, that's what this is. And you can also see some Jinja style syntax in between. You'll see that I didn't use the double braces and, and stuff like that here because I didn't want to interfere with any of the LaTeX directives, which uses the braces a lot. So I just use like, you know, big V, little V and big B, little B and things like that um, to identify variables and blocks instead. So that's what the script looks for. I'm not going to go through this file in detail. It's very complicated. But in general, when we typeset this file after doing the variable substitution, we should get a nice looking PDF. The most important thing to understand is how the variables work. So because this playbook just runs on localhost, there's just one localhost file which has the variables for all of our sites. The way this file works is pretty easy. These first couple variables here are things you can override that are defaults at the role level. So for example, I have to specify what is the name of my document template, and that's site. And also, do I want to make a zip out of this, or do I just want loose floating files? And in this case, I actually do want a zip, so I override that to true. And then lines 4 through, looks like 13, this is just static data that I want to print out in my diagram, but I do want to have it there so that I can show people what they need to ping or test or whatever. Now, I might be putting some of this in my config. So for example, the NTP servers, those might end up in my config, etc. But like the uh, router versions and stuff like that, I may just want to put that in my document so that the field engineer who goes to do the install knows what version he's looking for. It's just a string. I don't do anything fancy with it. The real meat comes with this thing called the entity list. This is a list of dictionaries, and basically for every site you want to set up, you just identify it in this list. So for example, I have a branch called branch 1. Um, I'm identifying what its internal range should be, and then my script, of course, will chop that up appropriately for all the different subnets. Uh, I have a PE to CE network for my MPLS uplink, so I identify that. Maybe I have a different uplink interface on different devices. So for example, different routers may have different interface numbering, so I can specify that. And then also the number of switch ports. So maybe some sites have more users than others. And these variables all play into the templates that I showed briefly earlier. They identify what information needs to go on that specific site. And then we just repeat the process for however many sites we have. So again, you can think of it like a, dump, like a nested for loop where, you know, for every site I have, and then for every configuration, make a config. So I should end up with two folders with two configs each. Each one gets a router and a switch. And then, of course, I'll have a documentation file as well. Okay, so next I'm going to run the playbook. And as it's running, it'll take, I don't know, 30 seconds or so. I'll kind of explain what's going on. Um, I'm not going to explain every step, but at the end of it, what we're going to do is we're going to copy that file to my local MacBook and then open it up and take a look at what the 
tool generates. Okay, so I put the word time on there just so we can get an idea of how long this takes. I think it takes about 30 seconds. You're going to see tons of stuff flying by as this goes. And I'm not even going to try to explain all of it. But in general, it goes through, again, like in a for loop fashion, does the configurations for each individual node, and then ultimately it's going to spit out a zip file. Okay, so it's done. Took about 22 seconds, so that's pretty quick. And then it gives me an SCP command. So if I'm a newbie to Linux and I want to copy this to some remote SCP server, I could just copy that exact command. But in my case, I'm going to initiate it from uh, my laptop instead. So I'm just going to switch windows real quick and copy this file over. All right, so I grabbed it here. All right, so there's my file. I'm going to just unzip it real quick and then we'll take a look at the structure. So as you may remember from the diagram I drew, I'm gonna have a number of different folders. So I've got a branch one folder with a timestamp, a branch two folder with a timestamp, and then in each folder, I've got the router and switch configs plus the site specific documentation for each site. And again, just to, just to briefly touch on that infrastructure file at the bottom, maybe you've got something that isn't branch specific. So when you add these new sites, you want to add those to your TACAC server. So you can make like a CSV file or whatever other format your TACAC server wants to upload those new files automatically. That's all that really does. It helps update your infrastructure with the changes made out in the field. So we're not going to dig too much into that today. So I'm going to suggest we just jump into one of these router configs just so I can show you the general idea. So when we log in here, you can see at the bottom there's a uh, specific interface and IP address. So this was the uplink interface on the branch one router. It has the proper gigabit port as well as the IP address for the PE to CE link. You know, and then we just kind of jump down in the middle of the file. You can see we've got our proper SNMP servers, our proper TACAC servers, our logging servers. We've got some uh, BGP network statements, BGP neighbors uh, at being activated. So this is all specific to the site. And rather than try to do all this by hand and screw it up one out of three times, we can just have these automatically created by the machine. So this really isn't a new idea, just a very basic thing, but it's a great step forward in very bureaucratic environments. Now I want to show you uh, the real technical challenge of this solution, which was generating the documentation that corresponds and helps support these configurations. All right, so this is a PDF file. It looks like it's three pages long, so this is a pretty short one. I just put a you know company logo up on there, and then it says site documentation for whatever the site name was. So this will be varying on a per site basis. Uh, then the Linux user who did it, so again, just default uh, EC2 because I'm using AWS and I didn't feel like changing it, uh, followed by the date time. Then I have a little bit of an abstract here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the general idea is it provides comprehensive installation instructions. So when the field engineer goes out to install this new branch, this is the document that he or she is going to have available. So we have a clickable table of contents here that was automatically generated based on how many pages there were. So let's just click on site installation. And now we just have a simple dummy proof checklist that tells the field engineer exactly what to do. So for example, you know, install the router, do whatever. And you can see like on line three, for example, I have specific commands that say, hey, do the show version and look for these software versions. So that software version was a variable substitution you might remember from earlier. As we make our way through the document, especially like steps 9 through 12, look at all that very specific show commands. So rather than a generic, oh, look for OSPF neighbors, it's like, okay, well, that doesn't help me. Uh, in this case, we give them the exact commands to look for specific to their site. So even very junior people have clear instructions on how to troubleshoot. And then, of course, the diagram at the bottom, all I did there was took a JPEG and then overlaid these tables on top of it inside of LaTeX. So I added just the basic information. It looks like something you might create in Visio. Uh, really not a whole lot to say about it. I think we can all appreciate as network people why this might be useful. I also added a few user entry fields. So here at the bottom, maybe the user wants to enter some data like, uh, I don't know, negative 6 dBm for transmit and, you know, something else. I don't know, negative 5 for receive. It doesn't really matter. I'm having a hard time with it. You get my point. You could save this file, and maybe this is useful for record keeping. 
maybe they could print this out and uh, tape it to the router so that if they're ever trying to troubleshoot some layer one problem, they know what right looks like. They know what the average is supposed to be. They're not trying to call the LEC and ask what the fiber reading should be. You can put little boxes in like that. It can generally be a useful document. Now, in real life, our documents were much longer than three pages, but I wanted to illustrate generally why this works. Now, think back to the old way. We used to issue this same information, except the difference is that this was automatically created. It's probably 100% correct, and it was much easier. We didn't really change the way we operated. We just changed the way we built our product. So everyone who used to sit in the chair and do their old job can still do it exactly the same. And I personally think that's the reason why the solution was successful. So let's go look at the outcomes next. So once we implemented this solution, I was pretty careful to try and measure how this was working. And at this point, you might be asking, well, what metrics did I use? I tried to pick the three that we tend to talk about the most often. We want it to be good quality. We want it to be done quickly. And we want it to cost not a lot of money. So in our particular environment, when we use this tool, we actually didn't use it for branch site provisioning. That was just kind of a, a vanilla example. We used it uh, in an ISP context to set up and tear down specific circuits for customers as they would join and leave the network. When I say defective products here, I'm saying that when we used to issue our configuration you know, PowerPoint PDFs in the past, Based on my estimation, and I know this because I supported operations for quite a while, is that about one in three were incorrect. That means that there were IP typos or wrong routers on it or just some other problem that was sufficiently confusing to derail operations that required detailed troubleshooting from a senior engineer. Again, based on my estimations, after we deployed the tool, I tried to track this pretty closely in conjunction with our NOC, and I estimate that about one in 50 had problems after that. And even though the automation tool didn't make mistakes because it's just a machine, sometimes we would encounter bugs in our configurations or somebody would enter the input wrong, but my testing failed to capture it. So we did have some issues from time to time. But in general, you can see like a 16-fold improvement here. So massive difference in the quality of the product. Likewise for time, you can imagine that building custom diagrams, hand substituting IPs, uh, coordinating information between like four different Microsoft Office applications, doing all this manually, then having someone do a manual quality check before sending it out, that was probably about eight man hours of work. So sometimes this could take several days, depending on resource availability, etc. Based on my estimation, you saw just a minute ago how quickly this tool can run. And even though it only runs in a couple minutes, Typically, we would also do a little bit of quality checking, you know, put a bow on it as one person suggested in our team. That can usually take up to 30 minutes to do the entire process. But even with that, again, about a 16-fold improvement from eight hours down to half an hour. So huge difference in lead time. Last, I just want to point out to all the American taxpayers out there that I helped save $2 million roughly. This is based on my math and my knowledge of government contracting rates based on the labor that we would have needed to hire but didn't. And you'll need to be careful here because I didn't say cost reduction. We didn't get rid of anyone that would violate one of our success drivers. Instead, we avoided adding cost by having to hire new people. This was a very rapidly growing organization, believe it or not, and rather than have to hire armies of new people to do this work manually, the automation tool allowed us to glide along for about a year or so without needing to substantially increase our staff. So I estimate this saved about $2 million, and this also accounts for a rough approximation of time saved from reduced troubleshooting and just better operational performance overall. So I haven't talked a whole lot about different people in this presentation because I wanted to focus on the technology and the specific organizational problems to solve, but I just want to point out a few different kind of conversations that happened after the fact. So this is one particular character. I call him Mr. Shut Up in Color. This guy's actually a personal friend of mine, and this is a phrase he says a lot. Usually when, he's, uh, when I challenge him on trying to do things differently, this is usually his response. It's basically a way of saying, no, just do what I say. So we actually had lunch about a month ago, and this was you know long after the dust had settled, and this, these were his exact words to me. And I thought that was pretty nice of him to say. It took a lot of courage on his part to basically to admit that he was wrong about it. 
and you know we have a great working relationship and he was actually one of my earliest supporters once we got through the initial hurdle he knew how valuable this he knew how valuable this was going to be to our organization another gentleman i call him the mr we've always done it that way uh, this person was even more dogged and even more resistant to change he was a, a longtime employee of the organization, had very fixed views on how things were supposed to work, and he played a very prominent role in operations. Ironically, he was the one who had the most to gain from this. You know, the Mr. Shut Up and Color was a, a very technical person, but the Mr. We've Always Done It That Way was very operations focused. And once he started to see the impact of this in the organization, he said that we can't live without this anymore. This is absolutely integral to our operations today. So I managed to turn one of my staunchest opponents into a huge believer and defender of the solution. So that was very valuable because you can see at my point, I helped deliver the solution and my entire goal was to allow other people to take it, run with it, improve it, and use it to improve their organization. And then last but not least, Mr. Because I Said So, this was actually the big boss. Believe it or not, he was actually pretty open to change, and he's kind of a radical. He's, uh, he's very opportunistic, but often in a good way, and he always had the organization's best interest at heart. He happened to just be very authoritarian about things, and if he didn't agree with it, it just wasn't going to happen. He was another individual that I managed to convince pretty early on, and he saw the real value of it, and he had a pretty big vision for using this solution in other parts of the organization, mostly as a way to chip away at the glacial pace at a, that the, a lot of these organizations were simply moving at. And because he had responsibility for a number of different networks, not just this specific one, he saw the broad application that this could bring. So as for me... I enjoyed a short victory lap for myself. I didn't exactly smoke a cigar and, and drink some fine whiskey, but I did appreciate the support of these three individuals. Together, we had helped build this network and build this organization, and I was happy to see it moving forward and get general consensus from everyone that this was the right approach. Now, at this point in the presentation, I would ask the audience for questions, but since this is YouTube, you've got a couple choices. You can comment below, which I suggest you do if you want to ask me some extra questions, but I've also captured the questions that I got asked in real life. So one question came from a gentleman that was serving in a defense department uh, from a nation in Western Europe, and his question was, what about the bureaucratic soft skills? How did I convince everyone that this was the right approach? The way I did that was, you know, I did my success driver analysis behind the scenes. I did that on my own and I came up with the, you know, the don't reduce jobs, keep the status quo, uh, keep the committees, etc. So you can't go to a bureaucrat and tell him that though, because that's going to offend him and he's going to deny it and then he's going to try to get rid of you. So you can't just go and say that straight to people's faces. So what I did instead was I said, look, I know all of your engineers are extremely talented and we need them in this organization. And to an extent, I did mean that. But I said a lot of these high fault, high stress, high risk things like building configs by hand, referencing multiple documents, I think we can overcome that with some intelligent automation without introducing risk to the network. So if you don't trust the machine to configure devices and cause outages, then you can still give people the power to push configs and do verifications on their own. This sufficiently assuaged them uh, and ultimately got, gave me buy-in to, to move forward with this solution. Another gentleman who worked in the United States at a small ISP asked me, what about approvals and paperwork? This is especially difficult in very bureaucratic organizations because generally you can't do anything unless a million people sign off on it. In this particular case, when I de whatever I deployed on the network, I ensured that it was sufficiently hardened to our very strict security standards. I provided all the paperwork and checklists for it. So I tried to make it as easy as possible for the leadership to see all the paperwork and then thank me by giving me a signature and walking away. And that's effectively what happened here. This allowed us to at least test the solution and put it into production without a whole bunch of committees and stuff. So I managed to bypass parts of that, although there certainly was some discussion at the more higher levels of government on whether this was the right thing to do. Ultimately, we decided that it was. This was a question I received from a very senior automation engineer working at a small company who specializes in it. He asked, why did you choose Ansible? Why didn't you just write a standalone Python script that would have been way faster? 
That's absolutely true. It would have. The reason I used Ansible was for extensibility in the future. For example, in the solution I demonstrated earlier, I'm just running locally, generating some configs from templates, and that's the end of it. But imagine if I take that same logic and I just expand the Ansible inventory to include live devices and change the connection from local host to network CLI or whatever. Now suddenly I have a workable infrastructure as code solution that has a similar interface to the old one. We can still generate our documentation locally, but just push our configs out to the devices. That might be the next step. And I didn't want to start writing custom Python code because it would have been harder to integrate that. Now, of course, today we have tools like Nornir, which can more easily consume that stuff. But at the time, I wasn't aware of it, and Ansible seemed like a good choice. And today, I still defend that decision. So another audience member that I didn't get to talk to after the session asked, how is it maintained today and by whom? So me personally, I'm much less involved in this project today, and it is maintained by a couple sharp people who work in our NOC. Now, initially, these were junior engineers who were just kind of, you know, point and click GUI type a few commands, low level types, but they've shown extraordinary initiative and learning capacity. Um, we've got a couple of them actually actively writing code, fixing issues, working the CI pipeline, and doing that kind of entry level DevOps work that you would require of someone who's doing both development and operations. Now, kind of an interesting role, we don't have a dedicated development team, so these individuals are starting to fill that role. But in general, combined with good documentation, good testing, and a little bit of good training, these other individuals are able to maintain the solution pretty well on their own. Well, that's the end of the presentation. Hope you enjoyed it. Please, again, comment with any questions you have. You can ask on YouTube. You can hit me on Twitter at NickRusso42518. And then I'm also including the GitHub link to the code that I demonstrated. So the MKFD stands again for Make Files and Documentation. It's a really simple Ansible role. Uh, I suggest you check it out if you found this interesting. Thanks again, everyone.